you have a Bible, which I hope you do, and I hope you have a note sheet as well, uh, turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. If you guys need notes or pens or Bibles, they're all in the back. Uh, make sure you grab one of those. We want to make sure that you are, are keeping up, taking whatever God's saying with you. I don't know about you, but if I don't, there's sometimes God will speak to me, and if I don't write it down, I was like, what did he, he gave me something so good, and I forgot. So uh, make sure that you write down anything uh, that, that God speaks to you this morning. Um, we're getting into the Christmas season, y'all, and so uh, the sermons are going to be sort of getting, getting you prepared for that. Uh, so I want to start off as you're getting to 1 John chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to start off with this fact that you need to be aware of. There is a war on Christmas. Dun, dun, dun. But it's probably not what you think. It's probably not what Fox News told you. Um, that, that, that there's a war on Christmas and they're coming for they're coming for your Santa Claus. I, I've noticed in the past decade, we we especially as Christians, we get really up in arms when someone comes by and says, Happy holidays. You're like, What? How dare you? Happy holidays. It's Merry Christmas. We say Merry Christmas in this house. Right? Y'all do know that holiday means holy day. And God is holy, and it's holy because Jesus was born. So, again, you can't call anybody a snowflake if you get mad about that. I'm just saying, okay? So, um, but there is a war on Christmas, though, that you need to be aware of. And that we know that because of what Jesus says in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come, and he came initially through what? Through Christmas, through being born of a virgin. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. There is an enemy that we have to face this Christmas. The thing is, it's not any different than the enemy we face every day. Right? There is a force at work that comes to steal, kill, and steal, kill, and destroy. It's hard to say fast. Uh, everything that we know, everything that we love. And this Christmas, the enemy's tactics go like this. Distract. Dissatisfied. Depressed. He's got a different arsenal for this time of year. The biggest enemy is not someone saying happy holidays. The biggest enemy is Satan coming and getting you so distracted that you miss Christmas for what it should be. And so I, I wanted to do this sermon early in the Christmas season so that we can make some decisions today. We can make some decisions now that are going to affect how our Christmas season goes. Right? Um, because you know, I was looking at the numbers and it really just kind of bummed me out. Because apparently 69% of people feel stressed to, a, to an unhealthy amount because of money or time at Christmas season. 69% of people at Christmas feel stressed. And the main cause, don't, not enough money, not enough time. In fact, 50, it goes on to say that 51% of people get stressed out with just the idea of gift giving. Is that y'all? Like you, some, some of y'all are really good at gift giving. You know the perfect thing to give, and it's so perfect, and, and, but, but I'm not very good at it. And so I, got, I get a little stressed. Like, is this going to be lame? Are they going to hate this? But the 51% of people get stressed out by get, even just the idea, not necessarily if they have enough money, but the thought that you have to go and present somebody a gift at Christmas. In fact, almost half the people that, that were surveyed in this particular survey, um, they would rather skip Christmas overall. Half the people that we come into contact with would rather just get this whole thing over with. And here's the thing, that'll not be. That means we're missing Christmas, right? If, if this Christmas was from Jesus, then like Matthew 11, 30 says, your yoke would be easy to bear. And your burden would be light. Your Christmas would be easy to bear and the burden from Jesus this Christmas is light. And so the big idea today that I think we need uh, to, to understand and walk away with is your Christmas needs more Jesus and less everything else. Can we, can we agree on that, that? That it doesn't need more lights. It doesn't need more presents. It doesn't need uh, a, another version of the Grinch movie. How many of those are they going to make, by the way? You're not going to be Jim Carrey. Okay, sorry. It's not going to do it. Right? But we don't need any more of that stuff. We need more Jesus. That's why I call the sermon not just Christmas, but Christ-mas. 
That's a bad joke. I'm so sorry. Y'all know y'all getting a bilingual sermon this morning. Did I put that? Did I put the uh, the accent mark right, Arturo? You don't know. Anyway, that, 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 neither one of y'all probably know where to put the accent mark. Come on, guys. Yeah, you're here. Yeah. Christ mas. Mas means more. We need. It's so funny that a holiday that that basically says more Jesus has less Jesus than ever these days. We need to have more Jesus in our Christmas. Um, so uh, the question we're going to answer this morning is how can we have more Jesus this Christmas? What are we going to do? You know, I think nobody would disagree with me here. Y'all go, yeah, yeah, more Jesus. Who would, who would hate that? Well, how do we get there? How do we accomplish that this holiday season? Well, to do that, we're going to head to 1 John chapter 2. And uh, uh, let's, let's read here starting with verse 15. It says this, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only cravings for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, the pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they're from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Now, I know that's not really a Christmassy verse. You're like, I want to hear about baby Jesus and the wise man. What are you doing? But I think that these verses give us a heading, give us a, a state of mind that we need to be in. So maybe you, you might, I would advise you this holiday season, maybe put those verses somewhere where you can see it, where you can read it, maybe a, a reminder on your phone. Uh, because there's going to be plenty of opportunities for us uh, to go off track here. And I want us to have more Jesus this Christmas. And so I think this points us to a couple things that we need to do. First thing we need to do if you're taking notes is push for his priorities. We need to push for the priorities of Jesus. By that, and I mean that when I say push, we're going to have, it's not just going to happen. You're just not going to have a holy, holly jolly Christmas without putting in some effort to make sure that you weed out the stuff that's not Jesus' priorities and make room for the stuff that is. Right? That's why it said, do not love the things of this world. Don't love what the world has to offer you. By the way, there's a lot that the world has to offer you. The world is offering 50% off now if you get there by Tuesday or whatever. You know? There, there's a lot of offerings that the world has for us, but it's not always uh, what's going to be a priority for God. Right? And there's many of the things that will just stand in complete contrast to what I think God wants for our Christmas season. Uh, for example, I've noticed that commercials... They've sort of dropped the subtlety and the pretense. If you Every commercial has one point. You get this, you're happy. Right? Especially during the holidays. You see all these, these creative commercials about, about uh, getting a new car or getting a new this or getting a new that. You want to make your Christmas awesome? Have this. And it's like they're not even trying to pretend to. They, they want to sell you a product. And we, and we I even fall into going, oh, that would be really nice, man. If I just had that, things would be so much better, but that's not always God's priorities. And so if we're going to have his priorities, what, and throughout the sermon, I just, I just went back and looked at what Jesus did. And I think that we should copy that. So one of the things uh, when it comes to his priorities, Jesus chose his friends by their faithfulness and not by their stature. This is one of the things that we can do if we're going to have Jesus' priorities, is he chose his friends by their faithfulness and not by their stature. Right? For a guy that was supposed to be king of kings and lord of lords, he rolled with a rough bunch, didn't he? They weren't the up and in. They weren't the powerful ones. They were the smelly fishermen that didn't know how to act at a dinner party. They were, they were the ones that not, maybe not everybody else thought would be worth anything, but he chose them specifically. Acts 4.13 commented that they could see they were just ordinary men. We're just, just a bunch of normies, just a bunch of regular old guys and, and, and girls. That Jesus chose to spend his time with. A lot of what adds stress to our holidays is who we're around. Can I get an amen on that? Some of y'all have come out and been like, I could not get out of that Thanksgiving meal quick enough. Me and Aunt Bertha were about to go around. Right? Um, but it's important who you hang out with this, this holiday season. Because that's going to affect your joy. Um, Proverbs 13, 20 says that the companion of fools will suffer harm. Just a little warning. Who we hang out with matters. Psalms, uh, Psalm 26, 4 and 5 says, I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. 
I hate the assembly of the evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Now, guys, do not quote that to your aunt at the dinner table and, and then go sit with the kids' table. Right? All right? That's not what I'm talking about here. But that's the point here, that there needs to be some healthy boundaries in your relationships this holiday season. I've noticed that, ever, that, that parents, grandparents, whoever, they're really good at guilt this Christmas season. Well, you all want to see your own grandma for Christmas. Well, you make me feel miserable every other month. Why would this month be any different, right? There are some people that need to have boundaries. That you, you, I know we feel the need to. Well, they share the same DNA as I do, so I guess i got to spend Christmas with them. That's not always the case. Um... I mean, in fact, Jesus gives us an example. Uh, I believe it's in Matthew 12 where he's doing ministry. He's healing people. And then someone comes and says, hey, your mom and your brothers are here. You're right, you can see like Mary going, come talk to your mother. I need to have a word with you. Come see your mother. I've been so lonely. And Jesus, what did Jesus say? All right, mom. And then he goes, no, he didn't. He said, who's my mom? Who's my brothers and sisters? And he said, y'all. Y'all that he didn't say y'all, that's not a Hebrew word, but you know what I mean? He said, you guys are. The ones that obey and follow God are my brothers and sisters. This is this gonna get you in trouble with some with some relatives, but just because you, it's a tradition that you go to someone's house doesn't mean that you go this year. Just because you're invited doesn't mean you have to go. I know. Wild and crazy thought. And guess what? Even if you go, that doesn't mean you have to sit through six hours of it, okay? You can come, have your meal, visit, and go on down the road. We have this, this false idea that we have to do certain things. There needs to be healthy boundaries. Now, I'm not saying, again, I know where your head is. Let me make sure you don't go. I'm not saying that you get to blow off every family gathering because you have some annoying cousins or something like that. Right? Or you don't want to get dressed up or you don't want to answer for all those awkward questions. Isn't there always that one relative that's like, so are you married yet? And you're like, oh. <laughs> or, or, hey, put on some weight this year. Maybe you should only have one plate. Thanks, aunt. Uh, you know, like, so I understand. But, that, but there are some healthy boundaries. Some of y'all have been uh, put through this, the ringer by your family, your biological family. Who says you have to go and subject yourself to that torture, right? There can be healthy boundaries with your family uh, that will add to your joy, that will take your stress level down, right? The people always say friends are the family that you choose, right? And, and so I spend, oh, there's a lot of times, I spend more time with my friends than I do some of my family because they're more of a blessing to me because I have healthy boundaries. So he did that. Jesus did that. He, he chose people by their faithfulness, uh, not just because of that, but he also put the needs of others above himself. You want to get more Jesus in your Christmas, you ought to try that out. Put the needs of others before yourself. You would think that I wouldn't have to tell you that, but I saw the Black Friday footage, right? Y'all tripping. Y'all are, not y'all, but you know what I'm saying? There, there's, it's, it's not just a natural thing to put others above yourself, but Jesus did. An obvious example is the cross. He says in John uh, 10, 18, No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again. Jesus says, Me sacrificing myself for you, no one made me do it. I did it by choice. I put the needs of you, us, before the needs of himself. It's not like Jesus wanted to go to the cross. He was sweating blood. Because he didn't want to, but he chose to anyway. He put the needs of others before himself. Matthew 20, 26 through 27 says, Whoever wants to be my great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first got to be your slave. Some of y'all are waiting for people to do for you this Christmas season so that you will be blessed. And Jesus is saying, no, opposite. This is not just a cheat code, by the way, to God's blessings. This is a call for us to live selfless lives. To, to think about others more than we think about ourselves. Because I have, there's some of y'all that in the years past, I, I've heard people say, Christmas just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm like, well, yeah, if all you're doing is thinking about what other people should do for you, you're going to be disappointed. Someone's going to let you down. But if you spend your time trying to figure out how to meet the needs of others, this, this really cool thing happens where you, you actually get those needs met yourself. 
and you're actually more fulfilled and more content than you spend in this next month going, I wonder what they're going to get me. I wonder when they're going to spend time with me. I wonder when me, 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 me. we got to make sure that we put the needs of others above ourselves. Jesus also put his focus on the Father. Do you think if anybody had the ability to be self-centered, it would be Jesus, right? He's, he's Jesus. But he says in John 6, 38, I've come to heaven, down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. He goes on to say in uh, John 8, 29, And he who sent me is with me, and he hasn't left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Did y'all catch that correlation? Right? That when you do the things that are pleasing to God, he doesn't leave your side. A lot of, I've heard people say, Christmas, I want to feel closer to God this Christmas. I just want to get back to where I feel, I feel the Lord again. You know how you can do that? By doing the things that are pleasing to Him. Because His, His presence is attached to our obedience. And so you, if you go the whole Christmas season being selfish, thinking about yourself, doing what you want to do, then you're not going to feel close to God. You're not going to feel like Jesus was a part of your Christmas. Right? And so those are some of the priorities of Jesus. So will you let Jesus set your priorities this Christmas? You, I, some of y'all aren't the, the type to sit down and make a priority list, but some of you are. And I would love for you to sit down and go, okay, this Christmas, what are my priorities? But instead of you writing them, you let the Holy Spirit tell you what is Jesus' priorities. That's going to help there be more Christ in Christmas this year. Another thing that we need to do is we need to walk in His footsteps. We need to actually, yeah, we need to have his priorities, but that priorities means we do what Jesus did. 1 Peter 2, 21 says, Jesus is your example, and you must follow in his steps. So what kind of things can we do to be more like Jesus this Christmas? Well, again, I went back and looked at just some of the stuff that Jesus did, some of the things that he was known for. And one of the things that I think would help us is Jesus enjoyed the moment. I don't know if you've noticed that. Read the Gospels and just see how Jesus' attitude and, and, and his, uh, his counting. You can't really tell like the look on his face, obviously. But just, just look and see how Jesus acted in certain situations. When the, when the disciples are freaking out about things, how chill he is about stuff. Um, Jesus enjoyed the moment. One particular thing that stuck out to me, um, there, was a, there was a time where Jesus kind of sent the disciples out on their first mission, right? Which had to have been cool. Like Jesus is telling you, all right, this is what we're going to do. And he's like, all right, here's the initial run. Here's the maiden voyage of the disciples. I'm going to send y'all out to some towns. You're going to spread the good news. You're going to tell people about me, and then you're going to come back to me and tell me how it went. And they came back, and when they did, now you would have made, you, you kind of figured Jesus knew it would work, right? Like when he was not going, I don't know if this is going to work out. We've got this plan to share the good news, but it might come back and we may have to rethink this whole thing. Jesus knew it was going to work. But when they got back and they told him what had happened, Luke 10, 21 says, in the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus was like some of y'all, you'd be like, all right, good. Notch in the belt, check in the box, let's go do some more. All right, let's go out there and get some more. We're going to win some more souls. But you know what Jesus did? He took time. If you go back to the Hebrew or the Greek or whatever, all the, the original language of rejoice, it actually kind of means jump for joy. Like I have to imagine, again, my mind went to, did Jesus have like a, a salvation dance that he did? Like how many people got saved? Oh, do the, what do y'all do? I don't know. Anyway, okay, I got to imagine that he, I mean, that's what the Bible says that the angels do. Whenever you say yes to Jesus, they throw a party. They like hit a button and the confetti explodes or something. I don't know what they do, but they, there's great rejoicing and celebration. Now, Jesus, again, knew this was going to come, yet he still took the time to savor the moment. This was a guy that half the time you read about him, he's at somebody's house eating. Right? Take it. Hey, go. Now, Jesus, go to the house. You got some food? Let's go. This is a guy whose first miracle was essentially a beer run. <laughs> I know, know your Baptists don't like that. But he, he didn't get drunk, understand, but he enjoyed the moment, didn't he? Some of us are going to get, if you're not careful, you're going to miss enjoying Christmas this year. Because you feel you got to get this. And you gotta, especially you parents, because you got to make sure that the kids 
have all the quintessential things that they need for Christmas, and you know you're going to get, you're going to run, 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 you're going to do all these things, and then January 1st is going to be here, and you're like, what just happened? When the whole reason to do Christmas is to stop and enjoy the moment, enjoy what it means for us. And so don't miss out on that. Jesus enjoyed that moment. You know another thing that he did, though? He befriended the outcast. He be Jesus was known for hanging out with the outcast people. That was really, that was one of the things that really fueled when, when we started at FFC 10 or 11 years ago. We said, you know, we, we need to be the church for the rest of us. We need to be the church for the people that really didn't quite fit in anywhere else. Because we, we thought that's the people that Jesus hung out with. Um, Matthew was a tax collector. I know that's not a big deal now. He, he was a traitor to his people, scum of the earth. And yet Jesus hung out with him. The woman at the well is not one of those type of people you want TMZ to catch you with a, a picture with out in public. She was not a very reputable type. The person, the, the, the woman that got caught in adultery, that Jesus took the time to call these others out on their hypocrisy. Guilty of adultery. Yet, Jesus hung out with these people that were cast out. That's what he did. In Mark chapter 1, uh, he tells a story of a man with leprosy that came and knelt in front of Jesus. Leprosy, remember, skin disease, ooh, stay away from me, I don't want you to get it on me. Right? It was a nuclear version of cooties. Right? And nobody wanted anything to do with that. And but yet he went to Jesus begging to be healed. If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion. Jesus didn't just do it. He reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Jesus engaged with people. He loved and valued people that the rest of society pushes to the margins. That doesn't want in front of everybody. That doesn't want to think about. That should inform our decisions on how we do things at Christmas. What a perfect time of year for us to extend some of that Christ-like love to somebody that maybe doesn't get accepted anywhere else. Right? Um, Luke 14, thir uh, 13 through 14 is a little more specific. When you have a feast, some of y'all are planning some feasts. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. You got to invite that annoying aunt or that cousin because you want to get invited to the family gathering next year, right? You want to be in good graces with grandma, so you got to get along. But when you invite someone that doesn't have anywhere else to go, that's where you get some rewards in heaven because there's no way they can pay you back. <laughs> there are people right now that, that God is going to put you in the path of this holiday season that, that you, God's going to say, open up your house to them. Invite them in. Either invite them to your family get together, you're going to get some weird looks. But do I, my grandmother uh, modeled this for me. My mom's mom, she was always the hostess with the mostest. She had like five kids, and, and so there, we had a huge family. And she had a big old house, and she was so, her, her, one of her spiritual gifts was obviously hospitality. And so she would host these huge family gatherings. And there would be like the, the, the sons and daughters, and then the grandkids. And even the in-laws would come, you know, and there would be a, I'm like, I don't know how I'm related to them, but they're here. But then there would always every year be like a couple more that had no connection. It would be the mailman or the neighbor or my grandpa's co-worker or somebody like that that my grandmother would invite in and treat like family. I was remembering that uh, on Thanksgiving. And God's like, hey, when was the last time you brought somebody weird to family dinner? Like, mm, it's been a while. Not, not, not I can remember a whole lot of that. Yeah. He, and, and again, that's the thing. It's not that you have to have them, but God is going to put people in your path and, and they're going to say, you know how you can love them? Hey, you want to come to my house for Thanksgiving? You want to come to my house for, for Christmas dinner? I, I don't know. You don't need to bring anything. Just come. That's the type of stuff that Jesus told us specifically to do. So we go, well, I don't, I don't know. That, that, that's going to throw off the family dynamic. Let it. That's what God calls us to do, befriend the outcast. You do that, you're going to get a lot of Jesus in your Christmas. Another thing is that Jesus did, and this is obvious, he gave more than he received. Right? He spent his whole life pouring into people, not worrying about what he was going to get back. That's what that verse I was telling you about earlier, Luke 6, 38. Jesus knew this to be true. If you're going to give... 
If you give, you'll receive way more than you can handle, so much more. You go, I can't afford to be generous. No, you can't afford not to be generous because God blesses those that are. Your, our Christmas lists, uh, and I know this because parents, parents, parenting has such a, a great way of forcing humility and forcing selflessness because them kids aren't going to let you live for yourself for very long, right? Um, and so have you noticed that the older you get and the more you get into parenthood, your Christmas list turns into, goes from stuff that I want to stuff I got to get for other people? Our Christmas lists need to be lists of ideas for ways that we can bless other people. Because it is, I mean, I, the, the most used Bible verse in the mall is what? It's more blessed to give than receive. I hear mamas tell little kids that all the time. I like this. It's more blessed to give than receive. So, no. Um, but the point is we have to reject that selfish desire for us to have more, more, and more. And be able to give more than we get. So, my question for you is, will you, will you live like Jesus for his birthday? Will you do the things that he did? Will you be a little mini Jesus running around spreading holiday cheer the Jesus way? But there's one more thing that we need to do. And this is the hardest. It's, I think, where we miss the most. I, I, I'm looking back. To, uh, some of y'all are really good at these. Some of y'all do some of this already. I'm not saying you don't need to check your heart and make sure you do it again. But number three, abide in his presence. That's what we need to do, and it's the most important thing we can do this holiday season, is abide in His presence. I get that from John 15. Uh, you may have heard of it. If you haven't, it's okay, but it's a really good verse to keep in mind. Uh, abide in me, and I in you. This is Jesus talking. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him. He bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus lays out this picture. He says, you've got to be connected to me. Do you want to bear good fruit? Does your, do you, do, by that, I mean, do you want to produce good things in your life? Do you want to have joy, peace, patience, self-control, kindness, all these fruits of the Spirit? Then you need to abide in Him. Now, your, your version may not say abide. It might, it might say remain. The definition of, of abide is, is really just to remain with, to linger around. I know abide is a weird word that we don't quite use anymore. But, but basically what he's saying is you got to hang out with me. you got to soak in my presence. You can't just pop in, get what you want, and leave. That's not going to work. You know, we like to say, uh, have you, any of you ever used this phrase, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Right, that's a good, that's a good little catchphrase to remember to explain to somebody. And I, yeah, I get it. It's true. But you can't have a long-distance relationship and call it a relationship with Jesus. Right? It doesn't work that way. If you're going to have a relationship, that means you do what he did. Yeah, but you don't just do what he did. You do what he did with him with you. With him by your side. The presence of God matters just as much. Every step of the way, Jesus makes it clear. This is the most important thing. Whether you do anything right for the rest of Christmas season, whether you do any of, you have any of the other trappings, if we abide, uh, abide in Him, we will be blessed and we will call it a successful Christmas. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. That whole verse is just describing just a witness, a togetherness. Not the, the, the blessings and the joy of the things that you'll do for me. Just the, the joy of the presence of God. That's what's important. And that lead, leads us to the last thing that Jesus did was Jesus got alone with God. Have you ever read the Gospels and noticed how often Jesus ran away from people? <laughs> right? Uh, Jesus got alone with God. In Luke 5.16 it says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I got a new perspective uh, this week. I was uh, reading a book that was talking about the initial, if y'all remember from the Jesus story, from the gospel story, you know, he gets baptized and the dove oh, comes down and God says, this is, this is my boy. I don't say it like that, but he's, this, he's good. He's, he's the one I love. He's the one I chose. And that kicks off the official ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist dumps him. And then what does he do next? Anybody remember? 
goes off into the wilderness, right? <laughs> 40 days where he gets tempted by the devil. Now, I'm always thinking that this is some, this is some survivor Rocky montage thing where, he, where Jesus goes out and proves his mettle. You know, like, I'm going to stand in the face of hunger and, and weather and I'm going to be tempted by Satan and tell him to be gone. But the, that word, the, the desert, that it talks about is actually translated lonely place, where it basically means Jesus just got alone. So it was less of Jesus running into a challenge and more of Jesus going, you know what I need? Some time with my daddy. I need some time with God. I'm about to start this impossible mission, and I need my father's help. So those 40 days in the wilderness was him getting alone with God. And we lost that. Because we're never alone. We, we've got phones. We've got tablets. We've got TVs. We've got people. We're never just alone with God anymore. And that is going to be one of the biggest things that's going to help your Christmas season is if you make sure that you have some time alone with your Heavenly Father. I mean, we're working real hard to make sure we have time for this side of the family and that side of the family. And we're, we're making sure that we spend time with everybody else. <clears throat> and so many times we forget to spend some time with our Heavenly Father. And so if you, want to, if you want to keep your stress level down, if you want to have a successful Christmas, if you want to have joy and peace and contentment, then take some time every day. We should be, by the way, this is the rule for the rest of the year too, but it's even more important at Christmas for you to take some time and, and get alone with God. Not just by yourself, but alone with God, with His Word, with prayers, Put the phones away, put the tablets away, lock the kids in the other room if you need to, give them some food in a padded room, and they'll be fine for a few minutes. And take some time and get alone with God. Colossians 3 tells us to put our minds on things above, not on earthly things. Not on, oh, I gotta do this, oh, I gotta go decorate this, oh, I've gotta do this for Christmas, and do that for the kids, and do that for. If you'll set your mind on the things above, for you die. Right? This is the worldly stuff that they're being offered to you. That's no longer for you anymore if you're a believer. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That means that maybe you don't watch all the classic Christmas movies this year. I know. It's a shame. But have you noticed there's more and more and more Christmas movies? They basically tell the same story, okay? Just swap out people. It's the same thing, okay? But there's a lot. Even if you don't get to watch Miracle on 34th Street this year or Elf. Well, maybe you need to watch Elf. That's a classic. But if you, if you miss out on some of the other lesser Christmas movies so that you can spend time with God. Y'all, that is the most important thing. Whether your kids get everything they want for Christmas. Whether your, your whatever dish that you bring to the family meal goes right or not. How are you rating this Christmas? What, what is going to make this Christmas a success? If it's anything less than me getting alone with God, if it's anything more than me celebrating and enjoying the things of my Heavenly Father, we're missing it. You're totally... Not, I'm not saying these other things are bad. Please hear me. Go caroling. Go buy stuff for... Don't be stingy. Buy gifts. Go do all these other things, but make sure that they're in their proper place. Make sure they're not on the throne of Christmas. Make sure that you, you, you always are putting Jesus at the head and at the most important spot. So where are you going to abide this Christmas? Where are you going to linger? Where are your thoughts going to stray to? Is it going to be on things that are going to stress you out? Things that are going to make you less likely to uh, be thankful for the things that you do have? Or are you going to abide in Jesus? I think we need to pray about that. Would you grab your eyes and close your eyes? Because we need some help with this. I need some help with this. Like, maybe you got this figured out, but I need some help. I'm reminded of that analogy of, of the vine that it keeps going. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then he goes on to say, not only if you, go, if you need to abide in me, but if you don't, what happens? Is I, I, I take those branches that are useless, that aren't growing, that aren't producing, I cut them off and I throw them into the fire. If we're not connected with Jesus, our vine, then that's where we're headed. 
And if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never asked Him to forgive your sins, because that's what cuts us off in the first place. That's what separates us from the vine and from life itself is our sin. And if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you and reconnect with you, then that eternal fire, that's just a picture of what we're headed for without Him. And you know what's even worse than having a, a Christless Christmas is a Christless eternity. And so whether you're here this morning or whether you're listening to the video later on and, and you, you're not connected, then it's going to be impossible for you to abide in Him. You have to ask. God has made a way for you to be connected with Him. He says it's through His Son, His Son Jesus. And so don't let this Christmas season pass without making sure that you're connected. And if you're not, if that, if that conviction is on you, then make sure you just ask. Don't ask for anything else for Christmas. Just ask for His forgiveness. Ask for His salvation. Ask Him to make you new again. But for the rest of us, it's a shame that so many of us have, have been grafted into this vine, but yet we're not producing fruit because we're not staying connected. We're, we're not necessarily going to be chopped off and thrown away, but man, we are not the healthy branch that we could be. And this time of year, it really shows. We start to dry up. We start to get brittle and break easily. That's not what God wants for us. This, this time of year should be a our hearts should be marked with, with joy, with anticipation, with thankfulness, with a comforting knowledge that Christmas means that God didn't lie to us, that God is a God that fulfills His promises, that He sent away for us to be saved and be drawn back close to Him. Lord, help us this morning to stay connected to You. All this other stuff just does not matter if we are not connected to you. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to prune back anything in our lives that's going to get in the way, that's going to distract us, that's going to choke out your presence. Help us to push it off to the side and help us to lean into your presence this Christmas time. And God, may it not just be a, a holiday thing, that Lord... It would continue on into January, February, March, and the rest of the year that we would be connected. We would be healthy. We would be thriving. We would be producing good things with our lives that come when we're connected to you. Lord, you know what our hearts need this morning. I just ask you to speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.